becomes clearer as uh, time goes on that the community out of which this gospel emerges were very advanced contemplatives who were experiencing the glorified Christ in their midst. The presence, in other words, of the, of the word not only made flesh and crucified, but now in the full enjoyment and possession and power of, uh, of life in all its fullness. The practical consequences for us of this text, of course, are enormous. Um, there's a paradigm in, in, uh, in creation of, uh, that throws a little light on what this text means. And I'd like to uh, focus on that in these few remarks. Uh, you've heard of the Big Bang, of course. And most scientists seem to accept that as fairly well proven. And the Big Bang consists of this extraordinary explosion of, of, with a density of matter that we, is inconceivable to us at a temperatures, again, and beyond our comprehension. But this initial thrust of creation was so condensed, so powerful, uh, that it would, uh, it would include the energy of all the black holes in the universe, which irresistibly draw into themselves all material being, including light itself, as you know. So there must have been something else present to, as an even greater force, to reduce that density to a point where it could move out in all directions that, as we know, have resulted in the universe that we uh, dimly see around us going off in all directions. And, and what is that force? a force that must have been inconceivably greater than the irresistible density of that first trillionth of a second of creation. This is the word, the initial vibration of the eternal word entering into a, a new existence that we call creation but powerful enough in its gentle but firm intensity to, uh, to disrupt this extraordinary gravitational pool of density beyond any conception. So now that creation has evolved in many directions and life itself has occurred, it seems that this this initial vibration of the word is, is still going on. It's at the deepest level of everything we experience. Uh, this is the word with whom every human being has been in contact, at least potentially, from the beginning of time until the end. This is the word uh, who, whose body, so to speak, has become the universe and later more particularly, a human body. And, and so, uh, when Jesus presents us with a formula for contacting this immense energy, he invites us to do three things. In Matthew 6.6, 6, he says, uh, if you want to taste or enter into a relationship with the eternal, everlasting, infinite source of all that is, you have only to enter your inner room, or private room is 
some translations, which refers, of course, <laughs> it's a metaphor, for the spiritual level of our being. And then he says, close the door, which is the symbol, perhaps, at least so it was interpreted by the monastic fathers and mothers of the desert. It, it's, it's the movement to silence the interior dialogue that accompanies most of us day and night in one form or another. Both the external world and the interior noise of interior dialogue prevent us from hearing the subtle vibration of eternal light, life, and love that is available to us at the deepest level, or as we call it, the center of our being. And uh, the third attitude that Jesus recommends is to pray to the Abba, the loving creator, uh, in secret. So, uh, the centering prayer, simply a, a way of detailing this formula for each period in human history in an appropriate way that can be most easily accessible to uh, ordinary people. So we've put it into one way, it's not the only way of doing it, obviously, because this word is omnipresent, penetrates all creation as a kind of, what should we say, a kind of primordial hum. Mm. You can almost hear it at times if you're quiet enough. And, and the ultimate secrecy that Jesus invites us to in praying to the Father is nothing less than the secrecy of the Father. Pray to your Father in secret, and your Father, who is in secret, will reward you. What is the reward? The perception, the awareness of that which is other than who we thought we were, and which changes our ideas about who we think we are. So in, in the centering prayer, then, uh, what we try to do, it seems to me, is to listen, listen, listen. Beyond, uh, we've left behind the external environment, we've left behind our own interior dialogue and concerns. There remains the third crucial point, to leave behind ourselves, that is, our over-identification with the false self and who we think we are. And this is the divine therapy that takes place in the inner room, the healing of the f illusion of an idealized self-image that is upheld then in ordinary daily life by the values of others, the, our ethnic group, or the working out of our emotional programs for happiness. So, so the, the sacred word is not a substitute for thoughts. So that the, the key attitude, it seems to me, for the full entrance into the centering prayer practice is, is to listen to the silence beyond the word, or if you prefer to listen to the presence of this word beyond uh, the words. To listen uh, then as we emerge from this uh, encounter with the ultimate vibration of the word of God beyond before it's articulated into any language or thought or feeling or perception. This hum, this initial presence, uh, some have called it the ever-present awareness of, uh, of what is beyond any kind of description uh, or articulation. In, but is always present. 
So it, it's this listening that frees us from the fascination and domination of diversity. There's nothing wrong with diversity. It's our over-identification with it that hinders us from hearing this, the word always present, always inspiring us, always manifesting, uh, trying at least to manifest the goodness and tenderness of the Father in everyday life. I think this is what it means uh, Paul is trying to say when he says we are in Christ Jesus. Christ refers to the eternal word. Jesus, of course, to the humanity of that human person we know as, as Jesus, uh, who was at the same time uh, in, in the mysterious way that we call the hypostatic union, united the fullest possible way with the Word of God. So this is, this is perhaps one way to describe what we mean in our theological principles by the divine indwelling. This Word of God that created all things, that is all light, life, and love, is present within us. What we may experience of this word is simply our interpretation of something that is beyond any particular or limited kind of, of expression because it, it, it is itself unlimited and contains all reality. So our access to the word is an access to everything else created and must put us in a relationship of union and unity with everything that exists. And so as we emerge from this prayer saturated in the values of the inner room and the, the, uh, and the freeing and liberating action of the Holy Spirit within us, we we must listen to this word vibrating in everything, in every one that we meet. Uh, the word is present in everything but beyond. We recognize and are present to diversity and at the same time uh, are aware of this ever-present uh, awareness that is beyond uh, the immediate contents of the moment. In, in the second principle that we enunciate in the uh, principles, there is this uh, really a crucial uh, point that you can never think about too much, and that is the focus of centering prayer is not merely on the creative word that I've just been describing, that it's manifested in the idea of the divine indwelling. It, it's present specifically in the action of Christ's passion, death, descent into hell, and resurrection. And, and, it's, and it's this manifestation of God that reveals to us uh, the inmost attitudes that is insofar as it's possible. Clearly, the Paschal mystery, passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus is the place where the revelation of who God is is most profoundly revealed. But since it's a human experience of Christ, it's totally present there and yet at the same time is, is beyond what is, uh, what is present there. Uh, Perhaps it's this uh, capacity uh, nourished by the regular practice of centering prayer. It will not happen by a casual practice of it. And, it's, uh, and, and practices for daily life can accelerate our access to this kind of, of dimension. I hesitate to call it the of kind of fourth dimension to the, to the, because it's much more than that. And some, some 
cutting edge physicists are saying now that uh, besides our three dimensional world, there may be uh, 10 or 12 other uh, dimensional worlds that we are not aware of. Um, the interesting thoughts to pursue in the next century. But how, how does the Paschal mystery reveal the heart of God in the most profound way that's available uh, to us? Uh, we will certainly not find it by just thinking about it, although this is a way to engage our faculties in the project so that at least they can recognize their limitations and accept the need for them to be still in the presence of this mystery that surpasses all interpretation by human means alone. Uh, it's this, that in, in Christ's descent into hell, he has taken our personal melodrama, the whole of our personal history, all the trauma, all the the guilt, the failure, the disappointment, and the feelings attached to those uh, more or less disastrous events into himself. Uh, what causes God pain is, is not our sins, but the pain we feel as a consequence of them. And, and this, I suggest, is the point at which we become united to God. Uh, it is not a place of personal accomplishment of any kind, but it's the place where we finally accept ourselves and our whole personal history just as we are, in total honesty and without any anxiety, realizing that this, at this moment of our utter powerlessness and weakness and, and to us failure of everything the false self wanted to achieve, that God is waiting for us and not only to encourage us, but to join us in that pain and to transform that precise pain into the rede redemption, not only for ourselves, but for the whole human family with whom we are absolutely interdependent and interconnected. So that means that what we do in a sense, everybody is doing. You know, what we don't do, everybody isn't doing. Or what others are doing are ours. And uh, the virtues of others belong to us as much as to them. So everything is in, in this world view that uh, seeing everyone as God's child, everyone is, is together in a mystery of unfolding love in which the primary purpose is to reveal not God's justice, but God's infinite mercy. Because this is, the, is what is, is God's choice for us, to manifest himself through mercy rather than any, any other manifestation. And so in our, in our practice to listen in our daily life to be aware. When we witness our thoughts in prayer, they have no control over us. It's identifying with them that causes all of those problems we have in prayer. And in daily life, it's, uh, it's not the diversity that is, uh, that is the problem too because God is present in everything. But the capacity to perceive in diversity this basic unity, the hum, the murmur, the vibration, and hence the presence of the eternal word in everything that happens, in every one, in, in, uh, in every event. And, and this is, is 
what it means to carry out the text that is uh, that we've just listened to. Of his fullness we have all received. As Paul said, I live now not I, but Christ lives in me. So living in the living Christ means that our daily life and its events are not just ours, but are the manifestation of God's love and tenderness and his intention to transform the whole human family into his glorified body and not just his suffering humanity. Uh, all this is, is, of course, suggested in the third principle of our theological principles, that the centering prayer leads to bonding, not only with others, but with the whole universe. And it brings with it a sense of belonging to this, uh, not only place, but this redemptive adventure that God has initiated. So, uh, to sum up these ideas in a very simple way that might be helpful, our first stage of our spiritual journey is to become fully aware that there is another, capital A, that is to say, that God is and is, and is attracting us, and is calling us, and has made us a part of a race that is mutually accountable to each other for everything that happens, even beyond our intention. We can't get out of the social consequences of being a member of the human race, hence it's in submitting fully to it, including the aspect of death that we uh, fully become who we are. To accept death is to accept God in a remarkable way. And to accept the little deaths of everyday life is to accept God in everyday life. The sign of the cross is an extraordinary symbol of dying to ourselves into the present moment of of renewing each moment our commitment to the death of the false self and to the fullness of the resurrection manifest in us uh, by the fruits of the Spirit and, and the Beatitudes. And it's this, the second step of this journey is to try to become the other. This tradition is called the imitation of Christ. And this leads not only to union with Christ, but to, uh, to a place that is beyond union, which is, it might be called unity. And, and, and this is the unity to which Jesus calls us in his last priestly prayer when he said, that they may be one, Father, as we are one. And that oneness in the Trinity is unlimited, it's infinite. So, so, so the vibration of the word is the fundamental basis of unity. It's indestructible. Hence all the diversity in the world can never change it. And, and in embracing that presence in diversity, we are freed from, little by little from our over-identification and our possessiveness, a possessiveness that extends even to our self-identity. Jesus in his descent into hell or even on the cross seems to have lost temporarily his identity as the Son of God. A, 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 a surrender that is almost inconceivable since he was God never ceased to be God, and yet 
in some de deep spiritual way because of experiencing the alienation of, of the consequences of our sins. He became sin and hence became, in a sense, the opposite of the Father with whom he was infinitely united. Here is the ultimate double bind, the ultimate opposition of opposites that plunges us into mysteries that are far beyond our comprehension, but which for some mysterious reason, uh, suffering, especially spiritual suffering, introduces us in a way that perhaps nothing else can. And that way seems to be through identification with Christ's passion, death and resurrection, the basic focus. So whenever we sit down in centering prayer, we're sitting down, so to speak, on the cross with Christ. And, and this means that uh, resurrection is certain. Perhaps the final experience of the word as the ultimate vibration of the universe, as that which is deepest in everything, or at least beyond all the senses, all the, anything we can imagine, all our thoughts. Perhaps that realization might be expressed in the final phrase, there is no other. Paul suggests this when he says that God is all in all. Christ is all in all. And in Christ there is no separation, there is no free man or slave, no Gentile or Jew, no male or female. At that level there are no differences. At the same time, diversity itself manifests God. But, the, but if we maintain or develop the contact with the divine presence beyond the diversity in everything that happens, then Christ has the opportunity to, to live in us and to experience human life in each of us in a way that no one else can ever give him. There is no other means that God is all in all.